My name's Dave, I work for Underscore as a developer, and I'm here to talk to you about building applications using type level libraries. Or more specifically, I'm here to talk to you about building applications end to end using only type level libraries, uh, insofar as that's possible. So that's the end to end part in this, this puntacular title. The, the title is given to me actually um, by a friend of mine, uh, a, a guy called Kingsley Davis. We were talking about possible um, submissions to this um, uh, a type level summit, and he suggested looking into this um, phrase that we'd heard around the internet quite a lot at meetup groups and so on, and that's the phrase type level stack. Who's heard uh, type level stack being used online, right? So it's becoming quite popular. And if a phrase is being used, it means people are interested in buying into a concept. But what is that concept? What are people interested in buying into? Could it be that they're just mishearing things, right? Or, or, or they know this phrase type safe stack, which now doesn't have, I think none of those words are still present in the official name for this. But um, everyone knows that phrase and type safe and type level sound quite similar and people like pure functional programming and they see cats and shapeless and spire and they go, yeah, okay, I can really build my application on this. Um, and so I'm interested in investing in the type level stack. So the sort of the foundation for this talk is just trying to find out what that means um, and what it could mean and what we need to do to achieve that. But in doing so, we need to settle some foundations. So we'll talk a little bit about what is a stack, like what components do we need to build up to make that? And we'll talk a bit about are these are stacks important? Are they important to us as developers, as library maintainers, and as, as type level? So uh, the foundation work is what is a stack, just to get us on the same page. Uh, if we want to define anything these days, uh, I think everyone will just immediately trip off to Wikipedia. So uh, this is the Wikipedia definition for a software stack. It's a set of subsystems that work together to build a complete platform so that we don't need anything more to build a library. So from a, a, an, a, an architect's point of view, I'm going to decide what I need to build my library. I'm going to build a fancy diagram like this and uh, I'm going to choose those components. And they, they might change over time. That thing might be fluid. I might add or remove a component. But this is an evolving concept about what do we need to support the app. And as, as, as developers, that picture looks slightly more complicated in that we have all these libraries. In order to talk to a database, I need a library. In order to talk to the web, I don't really want to have to build my own web library. But people who are interested in coming to type level are probably interested in the libraries that sit in the middle of this diagram. They're interested in, yeah, I want to use Shapeless to do all this cool stuff, and I want to use cats and, and, and so on. Um, but the, the other part of here, um, I would say, involves actually a lot more importance, because they, these are huge code bases. Web, web frameworks are not simple things. Um, and we need these things to work together to build our applications. So what does a type level stack look like? This is, um, I'm trying to find pictures with stacks of things. This has a lot of whiskey in it. I like whiskey, so that's my placeholder image for this. Um, first things first, if we look at the type level website, the new shiny type level website, um, there's not actually any promise here that there's a stack involved, no stacks. Um, this uh, tagline here says, uh, we provide type classes, instances, conversions, testing, supplements to the standard library, and much more. In, in one sense, that's a big, bold claim. We produce all of this stuff. In, in another sense, it's a very conservative claim, because it's like, we produce these individual things, and you can choose whatever you want, and you know, maybe they work together, maybe they don't. So there's no, there's no promises there. There's no promises that, 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 that um, like a marketing person might make if uh, this was a commercial entity. Uh, if you look at the bottom of this uh, website, you see the core goals of type level, and thus the sort of core goals that you buy into by putting a library into type level. So I think the main three are probably, probably these things. Uh, we're interested in free and Libra open source software, pure typeful functional programming, and uh, producing a friendly environment for people to get involved with the projects, the sort of code of conduct side of things. But if we look down in the corner here, 
there's a little tiny bullet point right at the bottom of the website, which is uh, we're interested in producing modular, uh, focused separate modules designed to work together. Aha, interesting. So there's a sort of a there's a sort of a promise and yet not a promise. It's a footnote. Now I don't want I'm not I don't want to I'm not I don't want to be too negative about this this stuff. I'm, there is a reason that that's there, and we'll uh, I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but uh, whether or not that is a promise about interoperability, it's hard to say. Um, so. I was going to give you a demo. So the, the original pitch for this talk was for me to write an application end-to-end, -end, just using type-level stuff, solve all the technical problems, then talk about all the technical problems. Now, that was not really enough for a talk, because it was disappointingly easy. Um, but also, um, I think there are interesting wider questions that I, I want to talk about. So I'm not going to demo the software, but I will tell you where to find it. So it's uh, an implementation of Todo MVC. Um, who has heard of Todo MVC? Okay, so for those of you who haven't heard of it, it's a, a thing from JavaScript land. There are way too many JavaScript user interface libraries, and people have a hard time choosing one. So Todo MVC is a project where there's a fixed user interface, a Todo app interface, and you implement that interface in your library, and then developers can come along and look at things and compare and contrast. So there's a, there's a, 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 a Scala.js implementation of Todo MVC um, based upon React and a library called Scala.js React and another library called Diode. Um, and I took that code, and all I did was add an API layer so that it, every time you change Markov for Todo, it saves it to a server, and then it reloads when you reload the page. Very, very simple. And that API layer is all based on, on type level libraries. Sorry. So what? What libraries? Another stack. A real stack this time. So if we go to the type level website and we look at all the libraries that are available, there are an awful lot of them now. I don't know. There are probably some on here that some of you didn't even realize were on here because there are some that only just got added. Um, and there are libraries to do all sorts of things. So I think we all know about uh, Cats and, and Shapeless Inspire, and incidentally, the modules designs to work together part of this, I think, probably comes from this core uh, set of libraries that do have shared um, underpinnings like algebra and things like this. Um, then there's the sort of the compiler plugin y library for library developer libraries. <laughs> so, like the underpinnings, things that have come out of the development of these other libraries and exist to solve problems. So like um, uh, uh, macro compat, it bridges uh, 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 um, uh, problems you encounter writing macros for multiple different versions of Scala and, and trying to solve that for you. And an export hook, to my, uh, to my understanding, uh, helps people uh, write libraries that use implicits together better. Is that a fair assumption? Give or take. All right, well, let's call it that for the moment. Because, uh, um, so, the, the, those libraries exist, and I think they're important, and, and, and uh, that's something I, I want to come back to. But then for the, the application developer, the meat is this growing set of, 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 of libraries from which we can actually pull um, key components of our applications. So for a very simple web stack, I can pull out these four libraries. Uh, so um, I don't know how many of you have used these before, but I will run through them very quickly. So Finch uh, is uh, Vladimir and Travis's uh, pure functional layer on top of Finagle, so it's a web interface. Cersei, Jason, uh, Doobie, that we know, is a database uh, layer. And I think everybody's probably used specs before. And from these, we can build an app. But imagine that I'm a, a very beginning developer, and I'm coming to this, and I start to look at things, and I see well, okay, well, some of these are built on CATS and some are built on Scala Z. I'm not really sure if that's going to cause many problems or not. I really don't know. Um, Async-wise, uh, Finch is built on top of Finagle. Finagle is from Twitter, and it predates SIP14, so it's using Twitter futures. Um, Doobie comes from Scala Z land, is using Scala Z concurrent and Scala Z tasks. And... Mm -hmm. I know that those things are going to hit one another in my app, and I'm not going to need to solve that somehow. So my new developer reaction to this is, is this going to cause problems for me? I'm, I'm not sure. Um, and, and I need more information, or I need a, a playground to, to look into these things. 
So um, I want to talk to you a little bit about code. It's a programming talk. I'll show you some code. So um, I'll show you little bits of this um, app working together. I think this cat might be excited about this bird. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about Finch, a little bit about Cersei, and a little bit about Doobie, but only for a couple of minutes. And I'll point you to find talks like this. Uh, it's Vladimir's talk from Scala Exchange last year. If you want to know about Finch and you don't already know, this is half an hour of light coding in which, case, in which he goes into 10 times as much detail as I'm going to go into here. Um, so Finch is modeling a, a, a web app as any functional programmer would, as a function from request to response. But it's uh, realizing the fact that we're not really interested in the request or the response. We're interested in the thing we get out of the request and the thing we want to turn into a response. So when we actually write code, we uh, don't actually deal directly with requests and responses. We use levels of indirection to pull data from the request and to send things back to the response. So just to highlight parts of this code, this block of code here is um, a set of predefined endpoints. There's an endpoint monad, which is forming a pattern to match on my request. So it's accepting get requests to a particular URL, and it's pulling out part of that URL as a long. And then in my app code, I'm taking that long and returning, in this case, a feature of an OK response. Now, <clears throat> a couple of things to notice about that. Uh, well, actually, one thing we'll notice in a minute. The main thing to notice about that is that when I say OK, I'm putting a to-do into that OK. I'm writing a to-do app, so I'm actually putting a to-do object in there. And uh, the library, the framework, is working out how to turn that into a JSON response um, during that call there. So um, I've, I've elided some details there, and I'll come back and let's look at, look at the JSON side of things. Um, Here's a save to do endpoint. So this is an endpoint where I'm posting a to do to the web server. Um, and this little guy in the middle here, this body as to do um, piece of code is code that interprets the body of the web request as a to do. And this, this is very exciting stuff to me. I mean, it's old news to some of you who've been working on these libraries for ages, but how many lines of JSON code have I written there? No, no lines of JSON code. Uh, and it all happens because there's a Cersei module within Finch that says, OK, well, I can parse this request as JSON as long as I have a JSON decoder. There's a, 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 a module from Cersei which will generate a JSON decoder for, for you using Shapeless. And so the entire problem is solved from beginning to end without me having to, it just inspects the type and, and gives me the body of that response as a to-do object. So that's very cool. Um, and that's also the way that we're serializing things as JSON at the other end. So the one thing uh, I, I want to point out about all that is it's all very easy, and it's all asynchronous, and it's all dealing with futures. Doobie, on the other hand, it's about the, uh, the I, I tried to find pictures of Doobie. This is the one I selected. You can, you can imagine the rest of the process. Um, if, you, if you want to know more about Doobie, and you haven't used Doobie before, uh, I think, Rob, was your talk, I, was it Scala by the Bay? Yes. Um, so this is a fantastic talk. Um, it tells you not only how to use Doobie, it tells you how Doobie is designed, and it tells you a bunch about the free monad as well. So it's a, it's a good blend of theory and practice. Um, but to cut a long story short, and to make things seem simpler than they are, um, so Doobie is a very thin layer over JDBC. It's just solving the, the sort of imperative nastiness of JDBC, but still giving you um, a very close level of abstraction. So we can build a prepared statement here using this nice string interpolator. Um, and that will take care of SQL injection and put the little question mark in and all that stuff. Once we've built a prepared statement, we can say, I want, you to, I want to interpret the results of getting things from that result set as to-dos. And again, there's a bunch of implicit uh, magic behind here that's looking at the fields in the to-do, looking at the columns we're selecting, and automatically uh, 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 mapping those two together. And then once I've got my query, I can turn that into uh, a thing called a connection I.O., a sort of an I.O. monad for database um, queries. Uh, here I'm using this option method to select one result, but I can select a whole list of results and so on. Um, and 
the, the, the key thing here is the, the connection I.O. monad there is representing either one query or a series of queries or a bunch of queries in parallel, all this kind of stuff. And our sort of end of the world moment here is this transact method where we pass that to a transactor, which is effectively a reference to a database. And that turns that into something which we can actually run, which in this case is a Scala Z task. Okay, cool. So now we have an interesting situation. And this is, I'm just using this as an example, right, of a whole bunch of, uh, uh, of similar issues that will arise as we uh, increase the size of this type level pantheon. Um, on the one hand, Zuby's giving us a Scala Z task. I know you Scala Z concurrent before this, so I'm learning this on the fly. On the other hand, we're expecting a Twitter future. Um, if you want to know, if you don't know much about uh, Scala Z concurrent, there's a good blog post by Tim Perret, which will uh, uh, give give you all of the missing details. And um, so you have to write some glue code, though. The, the short answer is you write something like this, um, which for a, a, a new developer is an interesting task. Um, but essentially, it's providing just one method there, which I call run as Twitter future. And then when I've done that, I can find to do. That gives me back a task, run it as a future, that turns into a future, send the future back to Finch, and end of story. Question, is this a problem? So I've got to confess that I uh, had some fundamental misunderstandings about uh, the uh, semantics behind Scala Z tasks. I didn't know they were rerunnable. I, this is, you know, I, I had a misunderstanding, I've never used them before, and Rob kindly helped me out and took my code and said, oh, I'll try this instead, and you know, this is sorting things out. And I'm you know, pretty competent with Scala. But, and I'm, I'm here writing this code here, just hacking it together. Great, I think I copied it from somebody else's example somewhere on the web. Um, but one thing I definitely don't know is what are the semantics of, or what are the underlying implications of doing this? If I run this, this complicated to-do web app at scale, web scale, um, is that going to cause problems for me? Am I, are there conflicting thread pools here? What's going on? I really honestly just don't know. Is it a problem that I'm writing this glue code? Maybe, right? It's, an open, it's a rhetorical question. Um, should this be documented anywhere? Now, there, is, there are bits of documentation around, um, uh, particularly about interrupt with Scala futures, but you can see this problem. Like We're going to see these in interop issues, and where should the documentation be? Where should the documentation be? Is it uh, Doobie's job to know about Twitter futures? Probably not. Is it Finch's job to talk about Scala Z concurrent, which it's not using? Probably not. Where should this be? Should this be at a higher level? Should it be somebody else chipping in and producing this? Should there be a cool blog post or maybe even a talk? <laughs> um, should it be a library, maybe? And you know, is there? And I only actually don't know what the answer to this is. Is there a, a simple way that we can just write a bit of glue code, put some be best practices into a README, ship it, and then stick it on the type level website? And this is an example of a problem that we're going to hit again and again. So um, I want to finish up. I'm going to run short. I want to finish up by uh, looking at this final question: Are stacks important? And there are three possible ways that we can ask this question. Are they important to developers? Well, of course they're important to developers. Um, remember this fine debate, frameworks versus libraries. Uh, there's no coincidence that web framework is a more popular term than web library. People just want to go there and get a bit of code and it solves all the problems. And with a framework, you get all these nice little libraries that all work together and it's all happy. But we buy into frameworks, we get bigger code bases, they take longer to get updated, we end up with legacy issues that are harder to get out of, and there's all these other problems. And the way type level is naturally evolving as a sort of a community, we are getting lots of independent libraries that do one thing well. And I think that's a great thing. But there are, there are problems to solve there. So from the point of view of a library maintainer, well, your library's gonna sit in a larger ecosystem and it's worth knowing where that library is going to, going to sit. It's also an interesting thing, actually. Um, we're writing functional code here, pure functional code. And one of the interesting properties of pure functional code is that we can reduce the uh, surface area 
of our, our libraries. So take that bit from Doobie. I start with a connection I.O. object. I built that. That's all Doobie. I've just you know, only used Doobie primitives to build that. And then I call transact, and it switches from being something in one context to something in another context. So my whole, I can kind of pivot at that point from one thing to another. And that's a very small surface area in which we can solve this, OK, we got back a task. We're just going to turn this into uh, this other type of async uh, primitive. And, 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 and so this is possibly a way we can look at libraries. We can look at where the interaction points are, and we can focus them down so that other developers can come along and solve the, uh, the, the, the connection issues there. Um, but finally, I guess it's worth asking, is this important to type level? And I don't mean like Miles or Eric, right? <laughs> I mean us, right? Like we're all, we're all part of the team. So um, obviously we're going to get more libraries in this, uh, this, this pantheon. This is going to grow. And uh, I kind of uh, mentioned some of these underpinning libraries that people are writing to solve problems about duplication of code and redundancy and compatibility issues. And I think there's, this is really interesting. To me, this is something which I've only really seen taking off in the last sort of couple of years. Like it's, it seems to be a new, deep, like deepening the strata of, 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 of Scala open source. I, I really like this. And I think there's a lot more we can contribute there. Another thing, and I, and I hate to be the person to, to bring this up, is documentation. Hey. <laughs> um, there's another goal on the, on the type level website there that we're going to produce uh, accessible and idiomatic learning resources. And I think there are great strides being taken towards this. Um, I'm going to pull up an example from the CATS documentation, not because I want to say anything bad about it, but because it illustrates a point. I can very easily find out how to use a monoid in the CATS documentation. That's great. But when I'm coming to this stuff, may not even know what a monoid is. So uh, how do I use a monoid is not the right starting point. Or not even what does a monoid do. It's a semi-group with this <laughs> zero thing. Yeah, great. What's it? You, know, you, you get the idea. But we need documentation like this. How do I solve large problems? Maybe th this is the, the biggest problem. How do I? <laughs> can you write my application for me, I guess, is the biggest question. <laughs> but like at various levels between these two extremes, there are questions which people are asking that we can, we can answer. And that's not necessarily the job of library maintainers, but it is the job of people writing awesome blog posts, or maybe we can have some kind of intermediate documentation thing. So these are sort of open questions. I think it's things that would be really interesting to talk about over the next couple of days. So just in conclusion, we started with this question of what is a type level stack? And I think where I've come to in this is there's not a type level stack, but we have this capacity to build multiple different stacks. After all, like, every application is different. We've got all of these libraries now. Um, they're all kind of great, and we can combine them in different ways. And the thing we need to do is work out how to draw them together into cohesive holes. And like, how can, how can we uh, contribute code, contribute documentation, uh, and support to people doing that? So that's all my material. I have a few people to thank. There they are. You know who you are. Um, and if anyone has any questions, Please, please ask them now. Should it be the goal of of type typeable us to like decouple? Like, so that maybe that's the in Finch and in Doobie, the fact that Scalzi and, and Finagle are in there is that they're too coupled. Could that be decoupled from that? The idea of a task runner or a futures library could be decoupled from. Should should type level yeah. goal be to like decouple those kinds of things, or should it be? This is what we have. We need to make it work as soon as possible. Um, so, yes. <laughs> uh, it, you know, it, this, that's a good question, and it is worth mentioning also that, like, for example, with Doobie, there are adapters in there that you, you don't have to pull things out as a Scala Z task. You can use the IO monad. So there's the option there to plug in uh, different um, different uh, compatibility layers. And may maybe the answer is you just write a direct conversion from one to the other. I, I don't know. But 
so decoupling is one thing, and providing assistance on combination is another thing, I think, definitely. Well, one thing I've noticed when uh, I've, I've been developing Rapture is that I've got, I've got a few modules in the same way that, that type level have a number of uh, projects. And I find myself creating lots of very tiny projects which contain just a single type class that links those two modules. What this does is it avoids either of the modules having a direct dependency on the other. But consequently, we end up with lots and lots of these tiny little single type class modules, um, which increase the number of dependencies that, that, that someone needs to include in order to, um, um, to, 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 to have these things interact nicely with each other. Uh, it increases the number of imports. I, I just wonder whether there's an opportunity for tools later on to um, to sort of fit with this model of having having these these tiny single type classes maybe imported automatically first of all into the class path uh, and also into uh, in, in, into your code when you when you when you put together um, a, a set of dependencies um, not not so much a question but more a, yeah. a rhetorical point well we and another thing which I, I forgot to mention um, you know, there, there are good examples of, of, of libraries that do just this kind of thing. Like, so like Scala's Egg Contrib is a thing which solves, it solves a, well, like three or four different problems, or solved three or four different problems. It gave you um, uh, support for futures in Scala 2.10, and it gave you like Yoda time support and things like this. And you can pull that library in, and it doesn't, it, it has, a, I don't know what you call it, but like um, uh, dependencies on Scala's Ed on other libraries where it won't pull them in automatically. What's the, what's the word for that? transient or something or something it doesn't matter so you can pull that library in and, and it, you know depending on what else you've got on your class path it will solve that problem there's a bunch of other code there that you effectively can't use unless you have the dependent library there but that's fine right yeah <laughs> okay so the um can you hear me yeah so the hi <laughs> uh so as you mentioned that doobie can interpret into it, it can interpret into any a uh, target monad that satisfies a couple type classes, and, and the problem is there does not exist a data type yet in cats, for instance, that can satisfy uh, the constraints of those type classes. So I think um, uh, a lot of this is going to come down to solving the I/O problem in in cats, and and once that gets solved, I think it'll become easier to start gluing these things together without the the little rough edge. So cool. It's just a comment. I wanted to create questions and create co comments, so. So, right, so just just to sort of respond to the earlier point that we can maybe sort of decouple things or kind of pull out, rather than having a concrete return type, we can sort of, you know, abstract and then people can kind of choose their own return type. Um, I think that's 100% the right approach, but I just having kind of been trying to do that for the last year, I think the big challenge that we're kind of encountering is that you, you, you can't get around a disagreement at one level by just pushing it to another level because you still have to agree that other level. So like the big challenge there is like, if you want to abstract over like IO and task and you know whatever, you still have to come up with what are the capabilities that actually define this, right? And that can it itself be a complicated question because different people have like different concerns, right? Like do you need to be able to run in JavaScript? Like do you need to be able to block or not, right? Like and so I think that's 100% the right strategy and I'm kind of actually hoping that this conference will be able to kind of poll people on what they really want out of like a task or an IO and should cats be providing that or not and should we use FS2 or I just think that's a complicated question that really requires a lot of like canvassing of opinions and like coming up with a very targeted narrow proposal that everyone can kind of live with or, or agree to. So uh, I saw that there were a lot of different library conflicts. Do does, I'm not terribly familiar with Scala. Does it have the same issues with versioning conflicts? Like if you have two different libraries that include cats, but one is cats, you know, 1.0, one is cats 1.2, yep. they get loaded into the same class loader. Is that handled by the class loaders, or is that handled by yeah, some other method when you're building? You can you can definitely get into that problem. Yeah. So you you have that issue as well, but that's not. Uh, yeah. Wait till everyone else is upgraded before you upgrade. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it, 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 I don't fully, I don't fully understand this stuff 
when it, so sometimes I'll get version conflicts, but it'll all sort of kind of just work. And I assume that's just because the binary, binary the same, these different versions of libraries, but that it definitely does happen. And uh, perhaps if anyone else knows, <laughs> can characterize when it happens more. There we go, okay. <laughs> um, not, not exactly, but there, there is something that, that it's, it's, it's very new, it's not widely um, uh, used at the moment, but there is, there, is a, there is a project in the type level umbrella which is hopefully aimed at addressing that. It's kind of something called Catalysts, and uh, it's a pro project that Alistair Johnson, otherwise known as In The Now, put together. And basically, it's a type-level SBT plugin, which provides, if you like, a profile, or the intention is that it provides profile of a complete and consistent set of, of versions of um, type-level and other libraries, uh, which ideally, if you pick a particular version of Catalysts, it will fix a particular set of versions of libraries, and they are all guaranteed to work together. And there's a whole bunch of stuff, I mean, more than just the plugin. Obviously, we need some way of validating that those versions are actually are actually are actually in practice compatible. And there are things in there which are kind of along the lines of things like the 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 um, uh, the light light. Light bend, <laughs> uh, community build, uh, and things like that, which which yeah. which which fit in the same kind of model. Um, so something along those lines is something we need to back it up as well. But anyway, that's that, I mean that sounds that sounds like it could really be a major piece of the puzzle, right? Um, community build type stuff, reference implementations of like reference code bases for like oh here's a here's an app that does this that uses this set of things we can compile and build that and it runs passes all its tests and everything else works then. Yeah.